the Buddha defines the world as your six sense media, the external sense media that make contact at your internal ones, plus the feelings and awareness that arise through that contact. That's the world. And the Buddha says also that it's your old karma. You should see it in those terms. And he also says that it's burning. So if we try to straighten out the world, we're working at the wrong place. It burns us because our greed, aversion, and delusion trying to hold on to the results of our past karma. And of course they're going to slip through our fingers. And all too often not be what we want, because after all, I can't go back and change your past karma. So the problem is not with the world. The problem is with our greed, aversion, and delusion. Now, this doesn't mean we don't try to change the world when we can. Our karma is such that it does allow for some things to be changed, for the better. But the real cause of the suffering around the world is not the world itself, it's the mind. This is why when the Buddha attacked the problem of suffering, he didn't attack the world. He attacked his own mind, attacked in the sense of focusing his attention there, and really trying to straighten things out. Sometimes we hear that the Buddha wanted to put an end to all suffering and wanted to treat all suffering no matter whether it was caused by things inside or outside. But again, he said the real cause for the suffering is your own craving and ignorance. That's not outside. That's inside. So you want to put an end to suffering in the world, you have to start here. This is where we're sitting here, helping the world by focusing on our own bodies and minds right now. Because the suffering comes with, from within for everybody. You can't go out and erase other people's suffering. You can't make them skillful, which is what's required to put an end to suffering. It's something that each person has to develop, him or herself alone. So here you are with yourself. And the things you see out in the world, the potentials for all the harm that people do, a lot of those are in us as well, which is why we have to look inside and straighten things out there. After all, there are a lot of things that we lay claim to, and if they ever get threatened, if we don't have an alternative place to find our happiness, we're going to really hold on and really fight back. Which means if we want to stop the fighting in the world, at least make sure that we don't go out and start fighting in the world. We've got to look at the things we lay claim to and find alternatives. So, if we lose, so that if we lose one thing, we can at least have something else to hold on to. You've got the breath here, for instance. You've got the sense of the body as you feel it from within. This is your territory. Nobody else can take this. Nobody else can even know it. This is yours. Your mind as you sense it from within. This is also your territory. So find some topic here in the body and the mind in the present moment where you can settle in, have a sense of well-being. We work with the breath because it's the closest thing in, the, in our experience to the mind without being the mind itself. It's how we sense the body. If we didn't have any breath, we wouldn't sense the body at all. And we work through the difficulties in the breath. One, because it gives us a good place to stay. Two, because it gives us hands-on experience with dealing with the processes of fabrication, how the mind fashions its experience. Sometimes it fashions things even before it's got the contact. It's already got certain intentions and ways of perceiving things that it's just waiting to apply to whatever comes up. But also because the movements of the mind are a lot more subtle than the movements of the breath. And if you can't 
see the subtleties of the breath, it's going to be really hard to see the subtleties of the mind. So time spent working through the breath energies in the body is time well spent. You're developing your sensitivities to what you're doing right now. Today in class we came across a sutra where the Buddha is basically saying that the things you do, whether you're doing them of your own accord or because other people get you to do them, they're still your karma. Whether you have an intention that you act on and you're alert to what you're doing, alert to the attention or not, it's still your karma. That's a scary thought. The mind is doing things and you're hardly even aware of what you're doing. And you're going to have to pay for it down the line if it's done unskillfully. So you're going to get really sensitive to what you're doing right now, starting with the subtleties of the breath or the subtleties of what other, other object of meditation you can find as easy, congenial, pleasant for the mind to stay with. Because it all comes down ultimately to seeing not only the object of your meditation, but also seeing how the mind relates to that object. There are people out there who say, well, how can you take the breath as your object? Because when you die, you're going to have to leave the breath, and then you won't have anything at all. When you focus on the breath, it's not just for the breath. When the Bodhi gives instructions on how to deal with the breath, he talk, talks not only about bodily fabrication, which is the breath, but also verbal fabrication, the way you talk to yourself. When you tell yourself to breathe in this way, breathe in that way, try this, try that, breathe in a way that gives rise to a sense of pleasure, breathe in a way that allows that pleasure to spread, breathe in a way that steadies the mind. You're talking to yourself to do this. And you see that. And then there are the perceptions you hold in mind, but get sensitive to those perceptions. Get sensitive to the feelings that come up from the breath. And then notice which ones, when you focus on them, allow the mind to settle down. So even though you're focused mainly on the breath, ultimately you find that you start seeing these other forms of fabrication as well. And that's when you can really see the mind. as you watch it in action. Same with contemplation of the parts of the body. In the beginning, you just go through and try to imagine the different parts, trying to get a sense of, say, when you're thinking about your lungs, where are your lungs right now? When you're thinking about your kidneys, where are your kidneys right now? When you think about your bones, where are all the different bones in your body right now? And you find that after a while that it gets easier and easier to visualize these things. And then notice that these things are really nothing to get attracted to. They have no real essence. And yet the mind can switch so quickly back to its old ways of seeing the body as attractive by seeing it as something you really got to hold on to. The question is, why does it do that? What's the shift in the perception? So here again, you're learning about the way the mind relates to its topics. Because it's the way the mind relates. That's where the causes of suffering are, not in the things out there. But it's how the mind fashions things, how it prepares itself to take on contact, and then how it embroiders that contact once it's there. These are the areas where the mind is the culprit, or it's the one that's causing the suffering, not the world outside, even though the world may be burning. It's burning with what? It's burning with our passion, aversion, and delusion. So the real work is done in here. And sometimes you may wonder, here I am working with problems with my breath energy. What does this have to do with the end of suffering, and how does this help anybody except me? Well, it has a lot to do with the end of suffering, because the, as you get more familiar with the breath, you're going to get more familiar with your mind. And as you can work through your own ignorance, you're going to be able to see where you're doing things semi-consciously, 
that are actually harmful to yourself or other people. You can stop that harm. So when you're working with the breath, you're working right close to the source. This is where the real work is done.